I've been looking forward to this project for a while. I guess you could say for me, it's an opportunity to carve out a fresh perspective in woodworking. Or at least I'm going to try. So today, let's look at things from a different angle on Timber Biscuit. So like I said, I've been thinking about building this project for a while now. And it's not so much the project that I've been really thinking about. It's more about the design and execution of it. See, I've played around with rounded edges, round corners, and sharp right angles in the past, but I've never really explored the triangle. So that's what I want to do today. And I'm going to do that while I build a console table, or a hallway table, or an entryway table, or whatever you call it. Potato, potato. But I want to do that in a way that really only utilizes raw materials, which is why you see me milling down my hardwood here. And the hardwoods of choice for this piece are going to be walnut and white oak, but we'll dive more into that once we get there. For now, let's take a quick moment and look at the design. So with this table, I'm going to be doing a lot of different things. From the trapezoidal top to some inlaid drawer fronts, along with custom poles and dovetail drawer boxes. And all of those things will share that similar theme of the triangle. And that of course includes the base that has splayed tapered legs, and a pretty interesting stretcher system that tapers towards the center. But we'll talk more about those details as we get to them, because there's a lot. For now, I just need to finish milling up my lumber for the panels. So, with all my boards skip planed over at the planer, I took them over to the joiner to put a fresh edge on them. Now, the reason I'm skip planing these boards and not face joining them and then running them through the planer is because they're S2S lumber or surface two sides. So, when I buy them from my lumber supplier, they're already pretty flat and I don't have to worry too much about reflattening them again. If this is all rough cut lumber, I would definitely be running them over the joiner first and then running them through the planer. But if you can get your hands on S2S lumber, it's worth the added time savings to not have to re-flatten everything. Now, that's not to say that all these boards are going to be perfectly flat. There's probably going to be some that have a twist or a bow in them that I'll have to work out. But for the most part, they're mostly flat. The biggest thing is to choose boards at the lumber yard that are mostly flat. And after a bit of time, you'll figure out what boards will work and which boards won't. So I don't really have a problem skip planing boards if I know they're going to be relatively flat. But either way, these panels are going to be three quarters of an inch thick. So I'm going to be using dominoes to keep those panels flat and reference all the faces anyway. So even if there is a slight bow or twist in those boards, the combined strength of those joints should level everything out. And if there is any odd twists in those boards once those panels are made, I can always go back and flatten them out a bit with a hand plane. So if there is a bow, it's not the end of the world. Either way, I'll just keep my eye on it and my other eye too. So like I mentioned, now that all my boards are milled down, the next thing I'm going to do is plow a couple mortises into the edges so that I can reference all those faces flat. This ensures all the faces on the boards are at the same height when the panels are glued up. And if you don't have a domino, here a biscuit joiner would work just as well. Now because I'm going to be grain wrapping this piece, the biggest thing I need to watch out for is that those dominoes don't get placed where those miters are going to live. So the outer carcass or case is going to be made up of two different panels. And since you'll actually see the miters wrap around the top of the table, I need to make sure that that top panel is longer than the bottom panel. This way I can cut those miters to get the continuous grain or waterfall edge. So with both of my panels glued up and dead flat, I can head back over to the table saw and trim them down to their final width. And as always, I say final width kind of loosely here because I'm about a sixteenth of an inch over my final size so that I can hand plane back to the final final width once the entire carcass is fully assembled. So once I have my boards to their final, air quotes, width, I could go ahead and cut in the inside bevel. Now I'm going to do this now while these are large panels, as opposed to when they're cut down to my mitered pieces, because it's much easier to cut a consistent bevel on one large panel than it is on four separate smaller ones. Next up on the GAN chart was to go ahead and trim out my sides, top, and bottom. Now for the pieces that are going to be mitered at the top, I want to hit those dead on, and that's because those are acute angles meaning that I have to cut those miters vertically at the table saw. Because as you know, all right angles are 90 degrees. So we need to make sure that our combined angles add up to 180 degrees for our two sides. And that sounds kind of complicated, but it's not. As long as you cut your acute angles vertically at the table saw and your obtuse angles horizontally at the table saw, and you don't move the blade between those cuts, the math is going to work out and those angles are going to align perfectly. The biggest thing you have to watch out for though, is that all of your pieces are cut to the correct length. So it's my recommendation if you're going to do this to keep your bottom panel or your more obtuse angles for your second cuts. It's a lot easier to adjust those horizontal cuts than it is to adjust the vertical ones, which is why you see more of an off cut in these shots. 
But if you guys want to know what these exact cuts were and you want plans for this project, let me know down in the comments. And as always, if there's enough interest, I'll put them together. So with my carcass pieces all trimmed out, the next step was to go ahead and lay out, then cut the stopped dados. So what I like to do is just lay out my markings on one board and then align and transfer those marks to my other one. And in this case, since my pieces are wide enough, I'm just going to go ahead and cut both my stop dados at the same time. This guarantees that both my joints will align perfectly as long as my boards are centered correctly, which I think is a heck of a lot easier than resetting and trying to cut the stopped dado two different times. And for these cuts, I'm going to be using a down cut bit because I want the cleanest lines at the top edge of that dado joint. If I was cutting mortises and I was really just worried about hogging out the material, I'd use an upcut bit so that it pulled the material out of that joint. But for this situation, a downcut bit is a better solution. Just be sure to stop at your line. And if you do go over, don't worry too much. You can always cut the shoulder a little short. Like the guy who invented crunchy peanut butter, sometimes you just gotta quit a little early. Next, I could toss in the dado stack so that I can cut the rabbit along the back side of the case for the rear panel. This is another situation where it's easier to do this when they're full panels most of the time. But because that material thins out so much, when I've cut the miters in the past, I've seen a bit of tear out and I'm not fully convinced that I won't see it again. So I kind of changed the order up this time. And since I had the dado stack and sacrificial fence all set up, I went ahead and cut the shoulder on my vertical partition. Then from there, I could swap in my miter sled and cut the rabbits on the sides of the case. And the last step was to trim down the vertical partition to its final length. From there, I could head over to the bandsaw and notch out the shoulder for the stopped data. Over on Instagram, I got a question about whether or not I'd use a sliding dovetail for this joint instead of a stopped data. And the reason I went with a stopped data rather than a sliding dovetail is because the assembly on this piece is kind of difficult. Now, originally I planned on using dominoes in the miters, and in fact, I went ahead and cut all those dominoes in. But when I tried to assemble this piece the first time, the dominoes were shifting everything and actually making it a lot more challenging to glue up. So instead of dominoes, I opted to go with blue tape and strap clamps, which I've also done in the past and had great results with, but I really like using dominoes and miters when I can. This is just one of those situations where it didn't work out. So with my carcass all glued up, I could go ahead and get to work on what I'm going to call my wedged partitions. And these are going to be partitions that wedge into those outside angles, which will give me a 90 degree wall for my drawer slides, which are going to be wooden. So we need this to be nice and square. From there, I could head over to the bandsaw and rough trim it out to its final height. Now, I did this at the bandsaw rather than the table saw because of that wedge. Doing it at the bandsaw also allows me to just use my hand planes to work back to the final fit, which I think ends up being a bit tighter than it would with just a table saw cut anyway. And while I finish that up, if you're finding this video to be helpful and entertaining, please like and subscribe. It really helps the video out, and I greatly appreciate your support. So with my wedge partitions all fitting correctly vertically, I could trim them down to their horizontal final width. And I'm actually going to cut these a bit shorter than you might think. And that's because again, I want to play off the triangles. So I'm going to nest these back from the front of my center partition by about a half an inch. This way I can cut some triangular blocks out of my white oak to give a little fun surprise of contrast when the drawer boxes are opened. So here I'm gluing my wedge partitions in place. And a good word of advice is to keep your offcuts handy whenever you're cutting mitered pieces like this, because there's no telling when you're going to need them again in the project, and they're really useful for glue ups. Here, I just use some double sided tape to hold those wedges in place and give me a 90 degree reference area for my clamps. From there, I can just use my miter gauge to trim out those triangles. In the last couple projects, I've really been playing around a lot with contrast. And I think this element, though subtle, is one of those tiny details that really increases the interest on a project. Sometimes these details can feel a bit gimmicky, but I feel like if they're used appropriately, like they are here with a tiny reveal, they make things more interesting. But I'd love to hear your take on it, so let me know down in the comments. Are you a fan of hidden gems within furniture, or do you find all that stuff kind of gimmicky? If you're a fan of gems, start your comment with gems. If not, and you think they're gimmicky, start your comment with gimmick. And if you start your comment with gems or gimmick, I'll reply to you guys first, because as always, I know you're paying attention. So next it was on to the drawer boxes. And since I have the drawer box sides all ripped down, I go ahead and cross cut them down to their final width. Now again on the drawer boxes, I'm going to be using dovetails. So here I want to make sure that I cut all my boards down to their exact final width. 
We don't want anything overhanging or too wide here, otherwise the drawer boxes are going to be too snug and they're not going to fit correctly in the case. Next, it was time to cut out the dovetails. And as much as I'd love to cut these dovetails out by hand, I just don't have enough time to do that on a regular basis, so here I'm going to use the Panta router. Now I've used this tool a few times in videos in the past, but for those of you who are not familiar with it, let me just give you a quick refresher on how it works. So basically you use these templates that are attached to the side of the jig as a guide. And you move those templates up, down, left and right based off where you want the machine to go. From there it's like a manual CNC machine where you move the bit around to outline those templates and remove the material from the edge of the joint. So for dovetails we first start by cutting out our tails using a dovetail bit. Then from there I'll swap in an upcut bit and cut the pins. I can adjust the fit on these tails by moving that template holder up or down to make sure the dovetails are snug but not too tight. And this type of machine is really useful whenever you're needing to batch out a bunch of dovetails. Because while it takes maybe 30 to 45 minutes to set up initially, it saves a ton of time by allowing you to batch things out. Now there's also a dust shroud that comes along with this machine, but it's kind of hard to see what's happening while it's on. So instead for you guys, I just remove it and clean up the mess later on. Now there's a couple different versions of this type of machine on the market, and I don't have any affiliation with any of them, but I am happy with this purchase. So if you're in the market, just do a bit of research and see which one fits your needs and your budget best. Because there's nothing worse than when the jig is up. And I mean, you can't really deny those results. Next I could take my work pieces over to the table saw and use a flat toothed blade to cut in the groove for my drawer bottoms. I prefer using a single blade over a dado stack for this procedure because for these drawer bottoms I'm going to be using quarter inch plywood. And quarter inch plywood is not actually a quarter of an inch, so it's a lot better to sneak up on the fit with a single blade than it is with a quarter inch dado stack, where you undoubtedly will have a loose fit on the drawer bottom. And I'm using plywood here because I A have this white oak plywood left over from the hutch build, B it'll save me some time not having to glue up panels. See, I'm going to end up lining these drawer bottoms with leather, so you're never going to see the bottom material anyway. And I guess D, plywood's a really stable material, so I don't have to worry about any wood movement. Maybe I should have just said E all the above and skipped the explanation. So from there, all I had to do was glue and assemble my drawer boxes. Now, because these are dovetailed boxes, they're already going to be pretty square, but I went ahead and threw an extra clamping square into the situation just to be sure. Because it would really suck if I popped these guys out of clamps and they weren't square. Luckily that was not the case, and when I did pop these guys out of clamps, I could throw them onto the workbench and just use a number 4 smoother to clean up the pins and tails. And then from there I could check the fit, and yeah, that'll work just fine. So since we're going with wooden slides on this piece, I'm going to be cutting in some stopped grooves in the sides of my drawer boxes to ride on those slides. And to cut those in, I'll use a down cut bit over at the router table. Now, I'll be honest, it's a bit unnerving to run a drawer box that you've worked so hard on over a router bit like this. But if you take light passes and feed your workpiece slowly, it's going to go just fine. Another thing that really helps is the downdraft table with the router setup, because the suction pulls the workpiece down into the router, which makes things feel a bit more stable. And the final depth I'm going for here is 3 eighths of an inch. So again, I'll just do that in two separate passes and stop when I hit the stop. Next, I can mill my slide material down to 3 eighths of an inch and then trim it down to its final length over at the table saw. And then lastly, rip down four sticks to half an inch, which again is the diameter of my router bit. So once I've ripped them down to half an inch, I'm just gonna use my hand plane to smooth out the saw marks and that'll also remove just enough material to make sure we don't have a super tight fitting slide, but one that's pretty snug. From there, the last thing to do is get these guys installed. So I went ahead and cut out a reference block so I can just slide that into the drawer box opening and then rest the slides on top of while I glue and pin them in place. Then after about 20 minutes or so, I went ahead and slid the drawer boxes in to check the fit. And there was a nice sigh of relief when everything was good. Next, it was time to get to work on the drawer fronts and the drawer fronts are getting an added triangular element to them in the form of a white oak inlay. So I considered a couple different ways to cutting this inlay and ultimately just decided to use my CNC. Now, I don't normally use my CNC for projects like this, but in this situation, there wasn't really an easier solution. 
While I could make a template and then route it out by hand, I really didn't see the benefit of doing so when I could just put it on the CNC. And I guess the only negative side of using my CNC is that it's not incredibly accurate. I mean, it's good enough to get most things done, but it's not spot on. So here I decided to make my carvings oversized and then just use my hand tools to give me a little bit more space to work with. This is like the ultimate mashup of modern and traditional woodworking. And doing it this way was actually a really wise decision, as you'll see momentarily. So next up I needed to cut some veneer. And to do that I'm just going to head over to my bandsaw and use a resaw blade to cut my veneer to about 3 16 of an inch in thickness. Now I said about 3 16 of an inch in thickness because I don't need to nail 3 16 right off the saw. Instead what I'm going to do is cut them slightly over what I need and then just use my drum sander to thickness them back down. And the final thickness should be just a hair over an eighth of an inch, which is about the depth of my inlay. Again, not perfect, but close enough. Now one thing I did do before running these through the drum sander was mark the ends so that I know where my book match is, because the goal is to book match these two inlays at the center. This way we get a nice mirrored look on the front of the drawer fronts. So as I mentioned, there was a bit of shifting at the CNC, and what I'm doing here is just trimming both my boards so that the inlays are evenly matched. From there I'll just rotate the pieces and trim the excess from the top. Now my two walnut boards are a continuous grain because they're from the same piece, but even I'll admit that that's not super apparent. So the next step was to go ahead and trim out my inlays. And to accomplish that task, I whipped up a quick tapering sled and trimmed them down over at the table saw. So with the inlays all trimmed down, I could go ahead and glue them to the drawer fronts. Now here I'm just going to use blue tape and a bunch of clamps. While I do have a vacuum press and I've used that on the channel in the past, I just didn't feel like it was worth all the setup to do two inlays. Though I'll admit after applying 18 clamps to each one of these inlays, it probably would have been a more efficient use of my time. I guess sometimes you gotta look at the forest instead of the trees. After about an hour I could rehang all the clamps and remove the blue tape. And since I already used the drum sander to thin these pieces out, all I needed to do was use my random orbit sander to flush everything up. Smooth. Next it was time to cut out the actual drawer fronts. And to do that I just made a quick template out of plywood to make sure my template fit nicely before I trimmed down my actual work pieces. This also gives me the added benefit of using this as a template at the router table so that I know my drawer fronts are going to be exactly the same. And it takes away any measuring that would need to be done to center them over at the table saw. Instead I can just reference off my marks and that'll ensure that the inlays are centered and positioned equally across the drawer fronts. So with my inlays centered, I could go ahead and trim the drawer fronts down to their final width. Now I didn't use the router table for this because I think these types of cuts are a lot cleaner when done at the table saw. And it also avoids having to route any end grain, which to me is a huge plus. So once I have the centers cut as close as possible, I could go ahead and angle my miter sled and cut the outside angles. And I think it's worth noting that in projects like this where you have a lot of miters, it's a good idea to keep track of all your angles. I know some people like to write them down. I personally like to take out my phone and snap a photo at where those angles were. This way I can always go back and have a visual reference. Now that might mean adding a couple notes to the photo, but for me it's safer than having a sheet of paper floating around in the shop. You know, sometimes we all wish we paid more attention at the first rodeo. So with the drawer faces fitting nicely, it was time to address the pulls. And on this piece, I wanted to do something more custom and make my own pulls. Again, really embracing that raw materials idea. So I went ahead and picked up this brass bar and decided to cut my pulls directly from the bar using my bandsaw. Once I had the initial squares cut out, I again marked my angles for the pulls and took them back over to the bandsaw to trim them out. The main thing here is that you want to use your finest tooth bandsaw blade. The one I'm using is 6 TPI, or 6 teeth per inch. This bandsaw blade's also pretty worn, so if it breaks in the process, I'm not too worried about it. And I don't have any problem cutting non-ferrous metals with it. So once I had my two poles trimmed down, I just used my diamond stones to remove the oxidation and smooth out any scratch marks that may be remaining. From there it was time to cut the mortises in the drawer fronts for the drawer poles to rest in. So what I first did was mark out their location, which is going to be towards the edge of the drawers. And then from there, I could just use my router and an edge guide to plunge in the mortises. Now, when I was designing this piece, I was a little concerned that the drawer poles might cause racking since they're so close to the edge. But I really didn't want to break up the line from the inlay by putting the drawer poles in the center. 
but I decided just to risk it with the interest of the design in mind and hope that things would work out. Luckily for you guys, you'll know pretty quickly whether that risk was worth taking or not. For me, it meant a couple nights of restless sleep. Anyway, I cleaned up the rounded edges using my chisels and then popped that guy in place, and when it seated fully, I was pretty stoked on the fit. Next, it was time to adhere them in place, and to do that, I'm just going to use some 5-minute epoxy, which is a lot faster than the hour or full day epoxy that I normally use, but I gotta warn you, this stuff stinks. I guess that's the trade-off for efficiency. My only tip here is just to make sure that you tape off the area around where you're using the epoxy. This way if there's any squeeze out, you can just peel up the tape and remove the drip. Sanding right up against those poles is going to be pretty difficult, so avoiding squeeze out altogether is the ideal solution, but we all know that's not going to happen. So after about 10 minutes of dry time, no cap, I was good to go ahead and pop on my drawer fronts. And to attach them to the drawer boxes, I'm just going to use some shims and some CA glue. Once the CA glue is in place, I'll just pop on a couple clamps to hold the drawer fronts in place while the CA glue dries for a bit, maybe another five minutes or so. Then from there, I can pop the entire drawer assembly out and pre-drill so I can screw some screws through the drawer boxes and into the drawer fronts. Now, this process only works if your drawer fronts and your drawer boxes are super flat. And if not, you might opt for using double stick tape rather than CA glue. From there, we can pop the drawers back in. And yeah, those are looking really good. Next, I could go ahead and mill down my 8 quarter material to an inch and a half. This will be the thickness for all of my base pieces. And then from there, I can use my template to mark out the location on each of my boards for where I want the legs to live. I kind of tried to predict where the straightest grain would be once my tapers were cut in and the legs were angled. And this again is one of those situations that sounds a little bit more confusing than it really is. You see, the reason that people use rift saw and lumber for table legs is because it gives them really straight grain. And when it's done correctly, that straight grain exists on all four sides of the legs. Well, because these legs are going to ultimately be triangular in shape, there's not going to be four sides. So I kind of have to guess at where that grain is going to live and what direction it's going to be going in once I remove that material. So it's a bit of a guess, but like Leo in The Revenant, you gotta bear with me. So once I had my boards rough cut out over at the bandsaw, I could take them over to my router table and slap my template on and template out the sides. Again here, I'm going to do everything I can to avoid the end grain as well as the joints because I'm going to cut those flush over at the table saw. Now, knowing that I have a half inch diameter bit to use for this process, I'm also sure that I only leave about a sixteenth of an inch of material for the bit to remove. And if you're interested in getting yourself one of these combination up down bits, I'll leave a link to it down in the description. From there, it was on to cutting the tops and bottoms of my legs. Now, the tops and bottoms are going to have mirrored angles, and that's what's going to allow for those legs to splay out. The biggest thing here is just making sure that all my legs are exactly the same size, and to do that, I just used my first leg as a template and used a marking knife to mark out the rest of the legs. From there, I can just use a combination of different sleds to cut down all of my joinery. Now, when cutting joints like this, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. That's why you see me hopping back and forth between my miter sled to a miter gauge to a shop-made sled. Because for any one project, I could use half a dozen or more sleds just to get those repeatable cuts. In woodworking, there's a lot of situations where it's better to be off once and be consistent about being off once than it is to be off three or four times. It's a lot easier to fix that one mistake than it is to try to hunt down solutions for all those different problems. So with the joint edges all trimmed out, it was time to cut down that outside angle. And to do that, I'm going to use the table saw. So the first thing I'll do is cut in my angle on the outside of all my work pieces. Then from there, I'm just going to use some blue tape to reattach my off cut. This will give me a 90 degree reference for my table saw when I'm cutting the adjoining angle. Because if I didn't retape this off cut back on, and I attempted to cut that opposite angle, I would end up with a leg that was super uneven. So with my leg all stitched back together, I could head back over to the table saw and let her rip. The only thing to keep in mind here is that once you get past the blade, there's no longer going to be the support underneath. So you really need to exit the cut by pushing through the blade. This way the leg doesn't stop and get chewed up. There you go. Four legs nice enough to make Ralphie blush. Next, it was time to get to work on the stretchers. And the first thing I'll do is just rip down two pieces that are two inches in thickness, which is the same height as the leg joint. Now, you'll remember early on that I said that these were going to taper, and they are. 
but there's a couple things I need to do before I cut those tapers in. And the first step is to trim all my stretcher pieces down to their final length. So once I had the final length on the right angled side, I could go ahead and cut in the angles for the center joint. Now these angles are a bit more math than just trial and error, so they come directly from the plan. That's because all four of these stretchers are going to align at the center of the piece, so I don't want any guesswork here. With the leg shapes all cut out, I could go ahead and plunge in the mounting holes. And to do that, I'll just use my drill press. The first hole I plunge is going to be an oversized hole for the head of the bolt. Then I'll swap in a 932nds bit and plunge all the way through. And that's because the bolts I'm going to be using are quarter 20, meaning they're a quarter inch in diameter and 20 threads per inch. Not that the thread count really matters. What's more important is that the bolt has room to move in the hole if there's seasonal wood movement. If I didn't leave that extra space, there's a chance that with changes in humidity, the base could get ripped apart. So with all my mounting holes plunged, I could go ahead and cut in the tapers. Yeah, woodworking is definitely all about those order of operations. Now, I've never built a base with tapering stretchers like this before, and what it's going to do is it's visually going to make your eye go towards the center of the piece, which at the end of the day is the ultimate goal. If we can give visual cues as to where we want the viewer to focus, then we can use those design elements to control the perspective. So with the stretchers all cut out, it was time to lay out the joinery for the base. And for the base joinery, I'm going to turn to the domino. Floating tenons are super strong, and when you double them up like this, they're even twice as strong. So all I'm going to do here is plunge in two mortises into each of my work pieces, then give everything a thorough sanding. And believe it or not, this is one of the more challenging parts of the entire project. Maybe not challenging, but definitely a pain. Because of the angles, the legs had to almost be completely sanded by hand, which meant I had to be really careful not to round over or sand too far on any of those angles, or I'd risk introducing some sort of wave into the line. So once they were sanded, I could start by gluing my stretcher to my legs. And to help with the glue up, I just cut a wedge out of one of my offcuts and used it as a clamping block on the outside of my legs. It's a pretty similar clamping solution to the one I did with the dining table and the bird's mouth joints. So once the glue had dried on those stretchers and legs, I could go ahead and glue in the dominoes that would attach the front and back stretchers together. And finally, once the glue was dried there, I could pop off the clamps and plunge the mortises for the center joint. Here, I was just sure to reference off the top of the base, since the underside is where that taper exists. If I were to reference off that, the dominoes wouldn't meet in the center because they'd be following the taper. Now for this glue up, I cut out two wedges and then notched those wedges so that I could clamp them to the sides of the stretcher. Then from there, I could just pop my clamps on and clamp everything to the top of my workbench to ensure things stayed as flat as possible. Next, we were on to the finish work before the finish. And the next thing I wanted to do was use a card scraper across the entire tabletop. This is going to give a super smooth finish to the tabletop, and as most woodworkers know, there's no finish quite like that of a card scraper. And then from there, I could go ahead and use my hand planes to clean up the outside edges. You'll remember earlier that I left the carcass wide so that I could hand plane back to the final dimension later on, and well, it's later on. And then from there, I could go ahead and route in my brand. Having a custom brand like this is another one of those details that really just elevates the furniture. In the past, I've used wood burning brands, but this brass medallion really fits this piece a lot better. So with the brand in place, I could get to work on attaching the base. And to do that, I'll just drop a brad point bit into my mounting hole, then use a mallet to give it a light tap. This will show me the exact drilling position for cutting my threads. And I'll start by using a drill guide to make sure my pilot hole is exactly 90 degrees. This has the added benefit of having a depth stop, so all my holes are the same depth. Now, I really like cutting threads like this, but I know a lot of people prefer a threaded insert. If I was really concerned about the weight or the strength of the mount, I think a threaded insert would be the way to go. But with a piece like this where it's definitely not going to see a lot of strain, I don't really see the point of using a threaded insert. So here, I opted to go with the wood tap. The last step was to cut out the rear panel, and for that, again, I'll just use the white oak ply. So with my mise en place, I could go ahead and get started on the finish. And for the finish on this piece, I'm going to be using a hard wax oil. Now I've used this same hard wax oil on the last five or six pieces on the channel and I'm not going to change anything here because I love the finish and I don't think it's worth changing. But while I finish up the finish, let me take a quick moment to say that if you guys are enjoying the videos on this channel and you want to support the show, I'd like to invite you to join my Patreon. It's a lot of work to shoot, edit, voiceover, and put all these projects together as I do them all solo in the evenings and weekends. But it really helps out to know that I have your guys' support. 
My Patreon members also get a bunch of behind the scenes content and other access that you just can't get through YouTube. So without taking too much time to go through all the details, if you're interested in finding out more, just click the link down in the description. And to those of you who have already joined, thank you so much for your continued support. Your donations go directly towards making these videos, so thank you. And hey, if you can't join today, no stress. Thank you for watching the videos and being a part of the community. All right, we're on the home stretch. So I went ahead and cut my leather pieces to size and then just used some contact cement to adhere them to the drawer bottoms. Just make sure that you apply contact cement to the back of the leather as well as the drawer bottom. And then wait about 20 minutes for both to tack up before you marry them together. This is another one of those hidden gem parts of the project. You can get leather in all sorts of shapes, colors, and sizes, so just have fun with it. And now that the drawers are completely assembled, I can go ahead and glue in the drawer stop. And to do that, I'm just going to apply a few drops of CA glue to a stick and glue it in place. This does exactly as the namesake suggests and stops the drawers from falling out. From there, I can flip the cabinet around and tack the rear panel in place. Here, I'm not going to use any glue in case I ever need to access the panel in the future. The last step was to drop in my bolts and thread the base in place. Then we can check out those glamour shots. I really feel like this piece has changed my perspective on woodworking. I, like many others, have been guilty of making my pieces a little bit bulky in the past. And this piece is kind of the opposite of that, where things feel a little bit more light and I took a little bit more risk with the design. And I think that's where, as craftsmen, we progress. When we go outside of our comfort zone to do something that we haven't done before, but something that still feels familiar. There's a lot of really cool elements in this piece and I'm not gonna list them all, but my favorites are probably the base, the drawer fronts, and the pulls. Each one is something I've done before, but not quite to the level that I've done it here. The design of this piece overall is also just really fun. It feels like everything just pulls you into the center and captures your attention. So I guess these were some angles worth trying after all. So hey, if you like this build and you want to see more like it, check out this video over here next. Subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And as always, I knew this would work, and I'll see you next time.